Okay. It looks like we've still got some people coming in. Stephanie, do you want to put up the poll while, while all our people who are on time can fill that out? Oh. This is just a way everyone can sort of say what brought them to this webinar today and why they're interested. And interesting fact, you can only put 10 choices on a Zoom poll. So I think I had many more types of people who might be interested in what light can do to your collections. Try and find a category you fit into. Okay, let's look at the results on that poll. I think almost everybody got a chance to click on that, hopefully. Oh, look at that. Almost everybody is either a collection manager and registrar on the conservation side or in the curating and exhibition area. That's great. And I'm fascinated to hear what other means as well. But at this point, I'd like to welcome everybody to this webinar called Lighting, Light Levels for Exhibition. I'm Heather Hendry, the Senior Paper Conservator at CCAHA, and I'm glad you could join me today. I'd like to quickly introduce the Conservation Center before I begin. This is the intro slide that I used for to describe all of our services before COVID as well, but we still continue to provide all of these things. We are a nonprofit whose goal is to preserve the world's heritage. We have conservators in the lab again now under careful distancing and cleaning protocols. And we're still able to provide education, preservation services, imaging and housing and framing. We've shifted to an online focus where it's possible. So our education and preservation is being conducted remotely as much as possible. And we've even been performing remote collection assessments. One thing I didn't list, but it's really important. We also have a grant writer on staff who can help you define and apply for funding for your projects. Like I said, I'm Heather Hendry, and as a paper conservator, I treat art and archival paper collections, but I also advise clients, conduct collection assessments and surveys, develop educational resources, and present programs. For today, I plan to give you a broad understanding of light. If you search online, I think you'll find museum recommendations for the maximum light measurements during exhibition. But these, are, these standards are really just broad bands that might not address your specific artifacts or how your institution works. I'd like to help you to make decisions that reduce the light on your collection overall, but you're also making sure that your collection can be accessed and viewed adequately. If you have questions during the, preservation, the presentation, you can pop them in the chat as we go and we'll have time at the end as well. And I can certainly back up if we need to go over any slides again. What is love? Now let's start with a simple basis of what is light. Light is a form of energy. It's the only energy that our eyes can detect. 
Visible light is a section of a larger group called electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation includes many other waves that you might also be familiar with, like x-rays or microwaves or radio waves. These waves all have basic similarities, but how they differ is by their wavelength. So even within the visible section, the different colors of light have different wavelengths. You see where it's expanded here. These wavelengths are measured in nanometers, so they're very small. They're on a very, very small scale. And that's how we can see things that are very, very small, is that light can, uh, is small enough to interact with these tiny details. The color of the rainbow that's shown here is also the order of the wavelengths. And we see rainbows because when white light is diffracted through a prism, different wavelengths will bend more or less. Now, within the visible spectrum, there are different colors that our eyes can detect. Most light sources will have all of the colors, that is, all of the possible wavelengths of light. And when, a light, when the light hits an object, it absorbs most of the colors of light. So in this picture, the green object is reflecting the green light to our eyes, but most of the colors are absorbed. If we remember that visible light is part of a continuous spectrum, then there are other invisible forms of radiation that may also be present. Ultraviolet is just past the purple when we arrange the colors by wavelength. And we'll be discussing ultraviolet as well as visible light today, and I'll usually be saying UV rather than ultraviolet. UV has a shorter wavelength, which translates to more energy, and it will interact with solid objects, both causing sunburns or fading art. Now, the UV end of this part of the spectrum has the most potential to cause damage. Visible light still has energy and will still damage, and there's not a sharp cutoff line between UV and the purple or blue light. We're making this distinction just based on what our eyes can perceive. I hope that what you've seen so far is that there's a continuum between visible light and UV light. So these wavelengths are again what I was talking about. This peak here, this orange peak, is visual light. This is what your eyes can see here. So if there's a wavelength that's over here, your eye can't see it, but the green line is describing damage and the power to damage with the light which is much stronger here in this UV section, which is invisible, but it's very damaging. So we usually talk about filtering UV because it's not going to change your visual experience anymore, but you see how much potential for damage there is there. Stephanie, could I get the next poll put up please? So when light, which is energy, hits an object, the energy will transfer to that object. There's a law in the physics of conservation of energy that energy can change form, but it's never lost. So often the light energy will change to heat, which you'll all be familiar with things warming up in the sun. So black or objects warm up more because they absorb more light. And white objects reflect some of that light, so they're absorbing less energy and becoming less hot as a result. But the energy can do other things besides turn into heat, including interacting with the molecules that make up an object. So Heather, I yeah. have um, question number two, which I'm assuming is your second poll. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. So can you see that now? I'm actually seeing sharing the results of what people's roles right now. Okay, on my screen, I can see uh, I'm sharing with you how you observed light induced damage to your collection. And that produced some really interesting results. Um, so 75% of our participants responded that yes, they have observed light induced damage in your in their collections. 
16 percent mm. responded that they suspect that that damage is there, but they can't be sure. Six percent said no, and three percent said, "I'm going to check after what I learned today." <laughs> That's the best answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I. Those are, that's the results on the polls. I'm not sure why you're not actually seeing it, but I hope it's okay to, su to suffice that I just read you the results. Okay, well, thank you very much. And let me introduce Stephanie to everyone. She is the manager of education at CCHA, and she's right now managing all of the technical side on this webinar for me. That's well. right, and thanks, Heather. And in case um, you haven't already done so, on the right-hand side of the poll result that you may be seeing on the screen that I've shared with you, you have to scroll down a little bit to see the results for question number two and question number three. So I've scrolled down on my poll results, and if you all individually scroll down yourself, um, hopefully you'll be able to see the answers to number two and number three. <laughs> Okay, I think we're still learning all the things we could do with Zoom. <laughs> Let's see. So as we get into the idea of light-induced damage, fading is the most drastic and the well -known, most well-known damage that can happen. And what we usually see is that some colors are more sensitive than others. So 20th century color photographs have a very sensitive magenta dye. So you might see the blues and the yellows looking almost normal. And fading can be hard to detect if you can't see an unfaded example to compare to. So if you glance at this picture and you assume the girls are wearing white or blue dresses, it doesn't look that unusual until you see the covered edge where the girl's dress was originally pink and the family was against a brown background, not a blue one. Uh, the open book cover on the left is very similar. It was on the shelf for many years. So the front and the back covers were protected from light, but the spine was exposed, so it's faded all down the middle. I also want to introduce you to the ideas of just noticeable fade or just noticeable change. This is obviously a subjective amount of change. So I used to work at this Canadian Conservation Institute, which is staffed half with conservators and half with scientists. And they were trying to define how much change was acceptable. So they brought in most of the staff to look at examples and classify them as noticeable, acceptable, or unacceptable. And what the conservators ranked as unacceptable, the scientists all classed as unnoticeable. So who you ask is going to really affect the answer of what is noticeable, what is acceptable. But I think it's useful just to have that conversation and that understanding that change may happen. It's a very, very broad rule. It might take about 10 units of just noticeable change to make an artwork unexhibitable. After about 30 units of just noticeable change, there would basically be no information visible at all. Beyond fading, newsprint is an example of a material that's extremely susceptible to yellowing from light exposure, especially from UV. It'll noticeably yellow very quickly before the sheet has even become weaker, but the loss of strength will follow soon after. And there's also a few pigments, like red vermilion, that darken from light instead of fading. Or you might see a result of darkening from the loss of fluorescence. The fluorescent dyes that you might find in highlighters or in modern bright white papers can become exhausted. So when they're no longer contributing that glow, the overall appearance might be darker. If you look at the orange and the yellow Sharpie samples here, the yellow side was covered while the right side was exposed to light. And at this point, the orange ink is almost completely faded but the yellow has lost its fluorescence and actually appears darker. And this will also usually fade in time until the ink's almost undetectable. The loss of strength from light exposure is due to photooxidation. Photooxidation is a term for a certain type of light-induced chemical reaction where the light's providing the energy that pushes that reaction forwards. And it 
generally happens on organic things like plastic, paper, fabric, wood, anything that's made out of long carbon chains. You can recognize it by seeing the yellowing, but it also results in brittleness, weakening, a loss of flexibility, and an increase in acidity. This reaction also relies on oxygen and humidity in the air. So you see how these factors all combine to create the deterioration. You'll see this yellowing very commonly on the varnish layer and the oil medium of oil paintings as well. And that's one reason why old master paintings have a golden glow to them. For black or white prints or drawings on paper, the media might be composed of a carbon pigment that's totally light fast, but the paper sp support will still be re weakened and embrittled by the photo oxidation over time. And the final thing to emphasize about light damage is that it's cumulative. I imagine that every work of art has a little personalized counter that adds every single bit of exposure. So you think about spending the day at the beach. No single minute of sun exposure is that damaging, but you will have a sunburn by the end of the day. Unlike our skin, museum objects have no way to recover and heal from the light exposure. So their sunburn just gets worse and worse every day. Every minute of light exposure adds up in this imaginary counter. So when you look at artwork that's 500 years old, it's had 500 years building up of this day was sunny, this day the curtain was closed, this day the photographers had their lights on for hours. If you look at artwork that's five years old today, you can imagine that 500 years from now, it will have that 500 years of exposure history that's built up. This is a fun comparison that I found when I was looking for images, where the painting on the right is the famous one, of course, but the one on the left, which is at the Museo del Prado, was also painted in da Vinci's studio at the same time. Uh, the two paintings have the same corrections underneath, which suggests that a studio assistant may have been painting the one on the left as Leonardo was painting and making changes to the one on the right. And I don't know the exhibition history or the materials of the Museum del Prado version, but I do know that the Mona Lisa will never be taken off ex exhibition because every visitor to the Louvre expects to see it. So we're seeing on the right, there's definite yellowing of the varnish and the oil medium, which is a result of light exposure. And there's also fading in the red tones Many red colorants are more light sensitive. So you'll often see an oil painting portrait where the fading is not immediately evident, but the people are a little less rosy than they should be. Clearly, I've just told you that light causes irreversible cumulative damage, but we can't just turn off the lights forever. We have to think about the mission of a repository and whether that mission can be fulfilled if the objects are never brought out. So I want to take a little time at this point to examine how light helps us to see objects and what factors go into it. Since all light is damaging to light sensitive materials, Excessive lighting causes damage with no justification, and underlighting causes damage with no benefit. So we're making a decision that some damage has to be accepted to allow the use of an object. But we need to make that damage both minimized and also worthwhile in terms of actually seeing and having that object carry out its purpose. The most obvious way to adjust visibility is by the amount of light. The amount of light hitting an object is measured in lux or in foot candles. A foot candle is literally based on measuring the amount of light hitting an object from a candle positioned one foot away. And then one foot candle is roughly equal to 10 lux. You may not have access to light measurement, 
So sometimes you can't specify exactly what the number of foot candles or lux is in an exhibition spot, but it's still helpful to think of light in terms of more or less. And you want to see all of the colors possible, no matter what light level you achieve. This can be described as the color rendering index or CRI. You can see how the colors visible in the same apple diminish as the color rendering index goes down. Daylight is considered the gold standard of color rendering because it has an even distribution of all visible wavelengths. This is also known as full spectrum lighting, which is used to describe some of the best light bulbs. A CRI of 100 is perfect full spectrum color rendering like you would get in daylight. Light bulbs generally come with CRI ratings and we would consider between 90 to 100 acceptable for exhibiting colored materials. But if you're working with mostly black and white documents, you may not need to prioritize color rendering to the same extent. Color temperature is related to color rendering. If you remember the blue or the gold dress from a couple years ago, I read an explanation that suggested your assumptions about the color are unconsciously based on what light source you thought it was photographed under. So people who spent more time under natural light assumed sunlight, and people who spent more time in artificial light assumed yellow, a yellow light. So if people know the light source, whether it's a warm yellow bulb or a cool blue, their brains will adjust how they interpret the colors they see. To show you how this can work, you see that the color in the apron and the color in the skirt on both sides are exactly the same. There's no change as you go across those bars. But we can look at the left rectangle and say, why yes, this is a black dress under a warm yellow light. Or we can look at the right side and say, yes, this is a yellow dress that's in the shadow. Daylight is a very blue light and we're also used to daylight being extremely bright. So if you have a blue colored light in a low light situation, it will feel underlit to the viewer versus having the exact same light level with a warm yellow light. This is a subjective experience for the viewer, and so you can't measure it with your devices, but it can make a big difference in whether people complain about a space being too dark. Our brains will just naturally adjust to interpret the situation based on many cues besides just the actual light hitting our eyes. This mental visual adjustment will also occur with dark and light tones. And this is another common illusion where the two gray squares are exactly the same color, but the darker surroundings make the left one look lighter and then the bright background darkens the one on the right. This is really re relevant in museums where you might leave the bright outdoors and need a minute or two to adjust to indoor light levels. A well-designed exhibit area will have areas of adjustment where the viewer's eyes will adjust naturally and it never feels like you're just stepping into a dark room. Our eyes are incredibly flexible, but it takes longer than you might realize to adjust. Usually 60 to 90 seconds to adjust to lowered lighting without feeling like it's dark. And it could be as much of, as 5 or 10 minutes for a really full adjustment. And we can also see visual adjustment within a single room. The color of the walls or any hot spots can really change how bright your picture appears. So here, the techniques used in a gallery to make the works on paper seem brighter. You have both a dark wall in the background and then pools of light from the spotlights that are making them brighter than the wall so that the art becomes the brightest and the easiest thing to see in the room. And another major factor that affects visibility is how fine the detail is. So even though this delicate miniature is painted with watercolors and it's very light sensitive, a certain level of light is needed to appreciate the details in it. If you think about detailed work, the light levels that you need for very fine work are way higher than we recommend for displaying watercolor. So this makes a real tension between what's best for the object versus being able to experience it. 
Now, this enormous Rothko painting, on the other hand, doesn't have the same tiny detail for the viewer to look at, so it can be enjoyed at any light level. And finally, we need to also consider the viewer. Everyone's vision varies, but your vision will also decline as you age. I think you typed that question right before I said this, but definitely older people need more light to see the same information that a younger viewer was. And so if you look at the grandfather in this group, the kids are just looking at the screen together really happily, but he's creasing his brow. He can barely see that, trying to make out the details. And seniors just need more light to see the same level of detail. For exhibitions, some people have suggested having special seniors days or tours that are just a few days of the year where the collections are lit more brightly than normal without having the lights made permanently brighter. If you have older people who are working, researching, or volunteering in your collection, this is also important to take into consideration because light levels that are too low might mean that the objects are just exposed for longer as it's harder to get the information they're looking for, or they might be handled more to try and see the information that they need. The visibility factors are all external factors that can apply to any object in any lighting situation. And let's take a closer look now at how light affects different types of objects. And whether we're talking about artworks or archival objects, similar components will behave in a similar way. The support that I deal with most is paper, of course. Uh, paper objects are usually differing from paintings in that the support will be visible, while a canvas painting is usually completely covered with layers of paint. In general, supports that are organic materials are going to be more vulnerable than inorganic materials like metal or stone. And there's also some correlation between a support's overall stability and its light resistance. So if you imagine an old handmade rag paper versus a modern newsprint, the rag paper is more stable on a number of levels, including resistance to light exposure. Usually it's the medium that we think of in terms of light sensitivity and the media is the carrier of information. So this is a thing that we really need to think about preserving as well. Um, either pigments or dyes are what create the color in any media. And just to distinguish between a pigment and a dye, a pigment is a little particle. It's a little chunk of colored matter. Well, a dye is a chemical that's dissolved and then it gets either deposited or attached. So in general, most dyes are more sensitive than pigments. So colored textiles and liquid inks can fade more quickly, but there's a big range in all of these things. A lake is a dye that has been bound onto a colorless particle. So it acts like a pigment in that it's a particle, but it's more likely to be light sensitive because it's a dye. To talk about the influence of the binder on protecting, I drew this little diagram to show you this would be a cross section of a work of art. So we imagine this bottom rectangle being the support. And then these are the little, pig the little particles of pigment, all the little colorants that are making up the image you're trying to read. In a piece on paper, these are usually completely exposed to the air. That's typical of ink or watercolor. There's very little medium surrounding the colors. On the right, on the left here, this would be what an oil painting looks like and that it, it might have the same pigment particles, but they're encased in a film, which is the hardened oil that's surrounding it and it provides a layer of protection because the air can't get at that pigment anymore. And so it's protecting it from chemical reactions that the watercolor is exposed to here. This is why even if an oil painting and a watercolor are composed of the same pigments, the watercolor is going to be more light sensitive than the oil painting. And oil paintings might even have this layer on top which is a varnish layer. 
Uh, the varnish layer is a filter. It's another protective layer over top. And the varnish is also a thing that's made that it can be removed and replaced. So if it becomes yellowed, it can be taken off and put on again. Whereas if you're looking at a piece of paper, when the paper becomes yellowed, that's not a part you can remove and replace. Just to comment on some common media um, for paper, graphite and charcoal derive their color from carbon, which is absolutely light fast, and it will be light fast until the end of time. Inks, though, often have a dye component to adjust their color, even if they also have a light fast pigment present. Something like a felt tip pen is almost exclusively dyes because they need to flow easily through the tip and pigment particles are much harder to keep flowing. So with, with a felt tip pen, like a Sharpie is marketed as permanent, but in this case, that word just means it's waterproof, not light proof. And black Sharpies actually fade really easily. They're not that kind of permanent. If you're looking for light fast markers or pens, you should be looking for ones that are marketed as pigment based or light fast but the word permanent is not really helpful. As we're trying to discuss how sensitive an object are, a blue wool standard is a standardized product where each color strip will double in the light resistance or the time it takes to fade as you move across the strip. So they're a way of demonstrating how much light exposure has occurred in your space. To use these, you usually cover one half to compare the change over time. So in this case, the top half here was exposed to the light and it faded, while the bottom half was covered up during that same period of time. So you can see the original color versus the faded color. And then you would describe this as having faded to the blue wool standard number two, or maybe blue wool standard number three is just starting to change. There's a very tiny difference there. There are some drawbacks to this in that first, reading blue wool standards is somewhat like closing the barn door after your horse is already gone. If you do it while your art is hanging in the same location, you can use them to say, why yes, that was too much light, but it's already happened. And the other thing I don't really love about the blue wool standards is that they were made for the textile industry. And so even the most sensitive blue strip on here is more stable than most paper objects. And so the scale just isn't sensitive enough for uh, paper collections. Here's the same idea where it happened with a sample of watercolor where half of the sample was covered and the other half got exposure. You see, most of these watercolors did fairly well for this length of time it was exposed. There's some changes of tone on some of the browns and a little bit of fading on this one. And in this case, it really went from a reddish brown to a grayish brown. And this is probably a case where there was more than one color being used to make up the brown and the reddish one faded while the gray one was more stable. And that's very, very common in an actual work of art that there'll be more than one color either coming straight out of the tube that the painter used or that the painter mixed several colors to make what they really wanted. So you can see a color shift even though the image is still here. You still see what the line was, but it's changing the appearance and how it should look. The browns did fairly well though, you can see. The reds on the other hand can be a lot more sensitive. The ones that don't fade are often a lot more expensive or they're more toxic or they might just not be exactly the color that the artist wants. So you can see how many shades of red here are changing with light exposure. And this is an example, like what we were saying, how the red will fade. You can just see traces of the original red color on the right side where the material was inside the steams. Whereas the blue, even though the red and the blue were exposed to the same amount of light, the blue looks fairly good and the red's almost completely gone. 
And I'll just quickly touch on the environment. If you recall, when I was talking about photooxidation, the energy and light is causing a chemical process that needs both oxygen and moisture for the reaction. And that's why an oil paint medium and varnish is protecting it. The most extreme way to prevent oxidation is to remove all oxygen from the possible environment. So this can be done for a few very rare art artifacts, like the Declaration of Independence, where it's displayed in a sealed case that's filled with an inert gas to prevent any further fading. Because again, this is something that's on display all of the time. And so by removing the oxygen, they can have less effect of the light fading it. Of course, the argon filled case is not going to be common, but simple improvements to the environment can help reduce the effects of light on all collection materials. So keeping the relative humidity lower and more consistent, using glazing to reduce the air exposure and keeping collection boxes closed after use. These are all things that are good ideas for other reasons, but will also help with light fading. And my final comment on sensitivity is that pristine objects could be considered more sensitive than previously exhibited ones. So here are two different versions of a hundred year old poster. They were both originally printed in color, but the one on the left has lost all of its color due to light exposure. The faded one is still vulnerable to light damage from oxidation. So the paper could be weakened, but I think there is nothing left to fade on this. This one is an exaggerated example, but in general, some colors are just so sensitive, but that by the time we get around to forming a light policy, the colors are already gone and the colors that are remaining are actually fairly stable. I think we're going to put the last poll here if you want to make that one live now. Uh, to see who has a way to measure light levels or UV. Oh, and I see almost a lot of people have already, and more than half of you do have some tools for measuring the light levels and the UV, which is excellent. That's actually a much better response than I was hoping for. If we think about the lighting policies and the traditional lighting standards, this is what is recommended and commonly shared. So you'll see these numbers here used when exhibits are being designed or loan agreements are being written. Based on studies of visitor experience, 50 lux is widely considered to be the lowest light level that will allow enjoyment of art. So this is not a magical number that says 50 lux is not harmful, but 100 lux is. What this is, is accepting that light can be damaging, but how can people still enjoy looking at an object? Enjoyment and perception are generally seen to increase as the light increases up to about 200 lux. But after that level, there's very little additional benefit that's been observed. And just to touch on UV, uh, again, traditional ratings say 75 microwatts per lumen. But in this day and age, there's really no reason for the UV to be at that level. Um, a zero to 10 is perfectly easy to achieve and a much better choice to make. So let's remember again, it's total exposure that matters as much as current Lex level. But these are some commonly used numbers. Now, I made this chart myself to expand and distinguish some categories within paper objects because we tend to classify paper items as all being sensitive, but there's a real difference in how quickly some things can be lost. These categories are not the same as the exposure categories we looked at before because we're lo looking only within the range of paper objects. So even the most stable paper objects don't compare to metal or stone. 
you can see that very similar items can appear in more than one category. So digital prints could be either very sensitive or fairly stable, depending on which ink was used. And of course, there's many, many examples that I didn't think of as I was putting in this chart. The items that I called extreme really should not be exhibited. And I would use caution even in letting researchers access these materials. Not that they can't be viewed, but having them exposed even for a day could cause significant damage. And so you want to be as cautious as possible for every single use on those. Items that are in the high or medium categories should certainly be available to researchers, but the display should be kept to traditional standards of no more than 50 lux and limited exhibition periods. The low sensitivity materials are a little more forgiving, but declaring something as low sensitivity really depends on identifying all of the components because an object is only as stable as its most sensitive component. Now, just to reinforce the units that we're talking about, light is either measured in foot candles or lux, and one foot candle is literally the light level at the distance of one foot from a standard candle. We can assume most candles are the same. Now, the recommendation for the display of paper objects was, was 50 lux, but what does that really mean in terms of viewer experience? If we can remember what it was like to take airplanes, when they turn out the lights, the airplane emergency lights are required to have a minimum average of 0 0.5 lux at armrest height or 0 0.2 lux at the floor level. So this is quite dark, but it's considered that this is enough for people to be able to get up and get off of a plane in an emergency. Part of the building emergency exit code is that the maximum lighting cannot exceed more than 40 times the minimum lighting at any time during an emergency. And this is a direct reflection of what we talked about before, that people's eyes need time to adjust when you're moving from a bright to a dark area. I think overall, looking at these examples, the real takeaway I get from this is how flexible our eyes can be. We can function well in such a huge range of lighting environments. Of course, your expected perceptions are different. So if you're out in the woods finding your way by starlight, I think you're happy just not to walk into a tree. And being able to look at something and enjoy it, you need a lot more light than that. But your eye can also accommodate up to 100,000 lux, and you certainly do not need that much light to be able to see what you need to see. And to untangle UV a little bit, we measure UV in microwatts per lumen. Uh, the little u with the tail is the symbol for micro, and it means one millionth of a watt. And these UV levels are always measured per lumen. So it's the amount of UV per a set amount of light. If you have a very bright incandescent bulb and a dimmer fluorescent bulb, there might be more total UV coming out of the incandescent bulb, even if the rate of the UV production is lower than the fluorescent tube. But if they're emitting equal amounts of light, then there will be less UV in a traditional light bulb than in a fluorescent. And you'll notice that daylight has a really high UV rate. And we've already seen that the light levels from daylight can be 100 or 1,000 times as bright as indoor lighting. So there's just an enormous amount of UV in daylight. Because UV is more damaging than normal light, but also doesn't add to the viewer's perception, Filtering the UV from any daylight entry is an easy improvement. And the LEDs, on the other hand, have a really low rate of UV production. This isn't always guaranteed across the board because there are different types of LEDs on the market, but there are definitely good choices available in the LED range. And they also have advantages 
in terms of energy efficiency and avoiding any heat buildup. Now the traditional museum standard for UV is less than 75 microwatts per lumen. And this is based on early work on lighting standards from the mid 20th century when incandescent lights were the only real option for museum lighting. So when people were coming up with museum standards, they sort of looked at the lights that they had. And when they decided that this much incandescent light was acceptable, they said, well, if that's acceptable, then the UV level in that light is also acceptable. And that's what we're dealing with at the time. But there's no real reason to stick with this standard with the options that are now av available. And I see there's some questions coming in that are a little bit more complicated, but is there more UV in a warm LED? Uh, I would recommend measuring it. LEDs are really interesting. The way they produce light is they send out very specific bands of uh, in a much smaller range than an incandescent bulb. And so they may be emitting absolutely zero UV or they may be emitting some. And I'd say probably there's less UV in a warm LED. And I would also say that the, um, the warmer the light is, the less damaging it is that just like UV is more damaging than visible light, blue light is more damaging than a yellow or red light. And so if your light source is warmer, it gives you two things. You can both have a lower light level without people complaining that it's dark. And it's also using a light that will be less damaging. So I like, I like if you can use a warmer color uh, light as long as it's, not affecting your color rendering. I think it's in general a good idea. And you can also check your UV, which is the best way to do it. I've got that coming two slides from now. Um, now, to measure your light, this can be done with a couple of ways. Other spot measurements with a light meter. We use an LSEC unit that can measure light, UV, temperature, and relative humidity all in the same unit. Or you can install the monitors that stay with your object and they record the light levels over time. And this is great for cumulative exposure. And I would say the faded blue wool card also describes cumulative exposure. And I believe there are reference standards because this is such a standardized item that can be converted into a certain number of lux hours of exposure that has occurred. Um, I don't have the exact numbers at my fingertips, but it definitely can be done. Both of these kinds of meters can be a little expensive. So I, I have some lower cost solutions that I can suggest to you as well. There's both free and paid apps for smartphones that will measure Lux levels. If you search in the app store for light meter, um, the best of these seem to test within about 10% of the accuracy of a proper light meter, which is pretty good. Um, you'd want to make sure you're getting an app that gives you a number in either Lux or foot candles because a lot of these are made for photographers and they'll be giving you aperture and ISO results instead. If you're a photographer, you can also use the light meter inside your camera on a blank white sheet. Uh, the beads on the top right are actually really neat. You can buy these on Amazon for like $10. And they will, under a normal light without UV, they just look white, but they'll turn colors if there's UV present. I'm not sure how sensitive they are, but it will give you a yes, no answer at least. Um, if you have, a very clear question like, is there UV filters on my windows? I think the beads would answer that question. Um, the blue wool strips on the left are a very slow indicator, but because it is showing you the total exposure, not the current light, it does help you to understand the whole picture of your light exposure in your display areas. And, you know, we can talk about measuring light levels, 
But the real point is that controlling light is a question of controlling the cumulative light exposure. And we need to really think about the long game and not just how much exposure is occurring at one single point, but really how much is building up over time. Light exposure is controlled by two variables, the time and the light level. The light level that we measure in lux is multiplied by the time in hours, giving us a unit of the lux hour. And so you might speak about a light budget based on so many thousand lux hours per year. Um, this is getting into a very specific level of management that I think you need to have a really good handle on exactly what your object is made of if you're going to be splitting hairs that finely. I think identifying all the components in your object is the big first step. And we should just always keep in mind that the light exposure is cumulative and irreversible. So any light damage will be permanent. And for anyone who's been dealing with uh, preservation for a collection, you're probably already familiar with the 10 agents of deterioration framework. Following this framework, each of the agents of deterioration has five steps to address them. Avoiding light is usually the cheapest and the least technological action. So the more time that objects spend in the dark, the less light damage they will get. But this can come into a conflict with our responsibility to share the collection. So we need to balance stewardship with accessibility. And I'd also like to highlight the last point here to use facsimiles as appropriate. So deciding when a reproduction is acceptable is a unique des decision for any institution, but the quality of facsimiles is getting better and better. And I think that the public also is becoming more understanding and accepting of it as well. So I think that if they're presented honestly, it can actually become an educational moment where the public is learning about how unique and irreplaceable your collection is. Um, if you're blocking the light from coming in, windows are your easiest target and the first thing to do, and this could be a question of blocking the UV or the overall light amount as well. Please note that UV film can become exhausted, so you should retest for the presence periodically and just assume that you will need to replace them after 10 years or so. Now, even if you've taken steps to reduce the incoming light, you still need a system to evaluate this, to evaluate success, or to pinpoint the areas that still need improvement. And this is a continuous process. One place where I can often detect light damage is when part of an image has been covered during the exposure time. So this watercolor landscape had a window mat over the top edge and you can see the original blue sky where it was protected here, but the blue is almost gone everywhere else. Then responding is a really key step. And this might be the place where the person who detects the problem needs to get more stakeholders involved in order to bring about change. But gathering data only takes you so far and it needs to eventually lead to action. And recovery is the last and the least desirable step in responding to any agent of deterioration. But in terms of light damage, it doesn't really even reply. This is one of the questions I get most from clients is if I can bring back faded media and the answer is just no. Um, but one thing the digital imaging lab at the Conservation Center can do is sometimes we can use UV light to detect faded ink so that we can create a facsimile where the original information is visible. And this is not possible for every document, but sometimes it can be very successful. And so the, the original came in like this and we were able to use UV to create a print like this, but it's still a facsimile. It's not um, a restoration of the original ink.
So just to recap what we said about exposure, this is really the synopsis of the whole talk. So you understand that light exposure is a combination of the time and the amount of light, and different objects will fade, darken, and oxidize at different rates. And now that we have this shared foundation, I'm going to run really quickly through a few real world examples of controlling light on collection objects. We'll be looking at all types of collections with both exhibition and storage concerns. So the sculpture court is a really common feature for museums that architects love to make these beautiful spaces. Visitors love to be in them. It's a great use of natural daylight and most stone and metal sculptures are completely impervious to light, so it's more or less a perfect solution. But a couple of possible pitfalls is when less stable sculpture might get included in here. This would be things like colored ceramics or painted or wooden sculpture. And another thing to consider is that the visitors transition into dimmer spaces when they go into another gallery after this can make these lower light areas seem very dim as well. Uh, thinking about transitions to darker spaces, you may not be displaying original artifacts in a lighthouse, but it's a really useful place to think about visual adaptation. That a typical lighthouse is in an extremely exposed area with no trees and no shades. And on sunny days, there's all the direct sun, there's reflected light from the water, so your visitor's eyes are incredibly constricted and they're letting in very little light. And when you step inside to climb the lighthouse, it's extremely dark except for a few windows. So the visitors will not be able to read text panels, look at artifacts, or maybe even see the stairs to climb safely. This can be adapted by having visitors pause inside before they start to climb the lighthouse. So if you have a small entranceway, a keeper's house, a place where tickets are sold, somewhere that's out of the direct sun and pausing before people try to climb up inside that dark lighthouse, extending that pause a little longer will give them the chance for their eyes to adapt so they're not blinded when they start to go up these narrow stairs. This is an example of a historic house where they couldn't apply a UV film to the original historic glass and they didn't want to install anything permanent to change the structure or the exterior appearance. So shutters and louvers were out of the question. They still wanted to use the window well for a display because their exhibit space was so limited. So in this case, the window was screened with a translucent fluted plastic board, which cut down the light intensity but about, by about a half, and it also insulated the window and reduced the climate swings as well. And even though there is still some glare coming through the window, the background fabric under these objects is a dark matte fabric so that they are showing up better than when they're completely silhouetted against the window. And the other thing is that the objects chosen are really well suited to having a lot of light on them. They're very, very stable that they're metal or black paper, black ink and white paper that can handle a little bit more light on them. And it takes advantage of it because of the details as well. Now, a purpose-built gallery like this may have full control of the lighting, uh, but they're still working with exactly what's installed here. So this is where the spotlights are putting emphasis on the paintings instead of uh, reducing the competition from the walls by just making a pool of light exactly where the painting is. So it seems brighter in comparison. Another potential source of light in the gallery is camera flashes. And flash photography is generally banned in museums, but I do not feel like it's a major preservation concern. It's true that the light's very intense during the flash, but it's so brief that it doesn't really add up to a significant exposure. 
So a flash pointed at an object from a meter away gives an exposure equivalent to maybe 10 seconds to two minutes at 50 lux. So it's not nothing, but it's not that much. Um, you know, there's plenty of other reasons that you might want to limit flash photography by the public because it could detract from other viewers' experience. It could distract the photographer who might be moving carelessly and bumping into other objects. But it's not going to be a fading disaster if someone sneaks a flash photo. Moving into storage situations, when artwork is not being looked at, any amount of light is unnecessary damage. So your storage should be as dark as possible. However, the staff still needs to enter the storage space for all sorts of reasons, and you might even have workstations in areas where the collections is stored. So the adequate task lighting will let your staff do their jobs and reduce the risk of accidents. If you have storage that is not kept in complete darkness, I'd recommend covers like this that can offer both light blocking and physical protection. If you have a number of framed items, the more sensitive ones like a watercolor and works on paper in general should get priority for the covers over the oil paintings, but it's not a bad idea for all of the framed items if the lights are on regularly. And similarly, I'd like to see everything that's in storage put into an opaque housing. Alkaline housing has so many other advantages related to protection from dust and moisture and physical damage, but it also provides light protection. If your collection is visible, it can be light damaged. So in these examples, the textiles are correctly rolled around the outside of the alkaline tube, which is what we recommend for support, but they're then covered with an opaque layer of paper. So it's protected from both the light and the physical damage. And the book on the right is being put into a four flap that's giving it the physical protection it needs, but it's also blocking light from it. And just overall vigilance will help detect other trouble spots, like if lids haven't been replaced in boxes or oversized papers are put uncovered on top of the storage units, you should be noticing as this goes through. Now, I pulled this case study from a museum with a really robust system of light monitoring that had controlled the light very carefully when they installed the exhibit. And they had data loggers in the exhibit cases. But when they looked at the light logs, they saw that this was the exhibition time, which was all exactly how they were trying to restrict it. But then at 7 p.m., there's this huge spike in the light that came in after the museum was closed. So after some investigation, they realized that this was the setting sun reflecting off a glass building across the street, which only happened at certain times of the year. So, and it was when there was no staff present to begin with. So no amount of checking during the exhibit would have caught this because it happens when there's no one there there's no staff to see it, there's no visitors to enjoy it, and it's a huge amount of light that was hitting these objects at this point. So not only were the pieces being overexposed, there wasn't even anyone there looking for them or looking at them. So in this case, the solution they came up with was every night they covered the case with a curtain on Velcro and it became part of their normal closing procedures. And the light logs after that showed that the peak disappeared. But I think that the effort of having to cover and uncover that case every night is going to make the staff advocate even more strongly for the planning of their next displays. And I know we're running a little past three o'clock. This is my final case study here. Um, this is George Washington's tent which he used as a field office during the Revolutionary War. It's one of the most important artifacts at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. The tent needed extensive conservation and supports just to be displayed. And the fabric really cannot afford to be weakened anymore. So the museum needs to display this with the least light damage possible. When you go to see the tent, it's on display behind glass in the theater. 
people are admitted once an hour and first they watch a 20 minute film about the tent and its use during the war and during this time their eyes are spending 20 minutes adjusting to the dimmer light of the theater after the film the screen is lifted and then the tent is illuminated and it's a very majestic presentation that makes people really appreciate the object but it means that the tent is only lit up to a low light level for about 90 seconds per hour and the visitors actually get a more meaningful experience of it than if they just wandered by and read the label text. This is a really lofty solution, but it's a great example of creative problem solving for a sensitive item that has to be on permanent display. And I'm going to go in and review the chat now for any questions I didn't cover during my talk. And so if anyone would like to add anything else, uh, we, can, we can look at any questions. So I'm just scrolling back to check on these. Okay, I see a question from Amber Kehoe about uh, cumulative exposure limits, which I think Amber is also a conservator. So this might be a little complex, but it absolutely is, the blue wool standard is, I think, a perfectly reasonable standard for paintings um, and sort of objects like that. But it does not apply well to paper because it's too sensitive. Uh, the paper is too sensitive. And there was a point where another standard was being developed, which has not gone into production. And I find that really disappointing. Um, so I can look through my references and I'm gonna write this down and see what I can send to you, Amber, that's more specific about this. Uh, if you like, Heather. Mm -hmm. I've already um, cut and pasted Amber's entire message into a Teams message to you. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so thank, much. Yeah, sure. And thank you, Amber, for providing your email address, too, because I, I cut and pasted that directly to Heather. Okay, that's perfect. Um, I see Ann Baker is asking about feathers, and I feel like as a paper conservator, I do not have a great handle on that sort of collection. And so I would use this general information to reduce the light exposure on them, uh, but I do not have any more specific information. Um, feathers are actually fascinating though, because their colors are made up from so many different sources. Some of them are pigments, some of them are dyes, and some of them are actually caused by diffraction. And so it's their physical shape of on a micro level that causes the color. And so physical damage will also cause color loss in some colors on feathers. Um, so yes, I would just keep them as protected as possible. It's the full answer. Um, let's see. I have someone asking, how does halogen compare to LEDs for UV? And I would say I do not know anything specifically about halogen lights because um, I haven't really looked into that in a museum lighting uh, setting. So I know that for LEDs, you can get uh, almost zero UV, but for almost any light, you can get a filter for it. So even lights that do have a lot of UV light, like for example, in our lab, we use fluorescent lights, uh, but we have filters on them that take out the UV. So I would recommend checking your halogen lights either by getting information from the manufacturer or by measuring what UV you're getting. And if, it's, if you are finding UV, I'm sure you can find a filter for it. Um, Let's see, I see someone asking for book recommendations, which I have a reference sheet, which I believe uh, there is 
Uh, there is a bibliography if you look at the technical bulletin on their website and that link should have already been posted. So I would recommend looking at those resources. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question about using case studies and standards for talking to upper management. Um, I would recommend looking at uh, published museum guidelines and trying to find something that's really customized to your collection um, or the most similar. Okay, Kimberly asks, do you have suggestions for mixed medium objects where it is not one specific object? For example, a wooden clock with a paper dial with oil paint or watercolor? Uh, the answer is you need to treat it like the most sensitive part of that object. So even if you have something completely insensitive, like uh, marble or metal, if there is watercolor on it, then it is as sensitive as a watercolor on paper. And you need to put it into the most sensitive category possible uh, based on the different components. see. When original watercolors are being displayed, is there a good way to tell if the colors in the watercolor are fugitive? Or is this a situation where you really need to know the artist's materials or have a strong background knowledge of watercolor? I would say you should always assume that watercolors are fugitive because any palette that you buy, most colors will be Many colors might be fine, but there'll be one or two colors that are fugitive. And so it will change the appearance of the artwork, even if only one color out of the 20 that the artist used, if one color fades, it changes everything. So I see it a lot of times in greens, uh, in shrubbery, the yellow might fade. And so you end up with very bluish shrubs or the blue might fade and you end up with brown shrubs. Um, and so there's going to be something in there that will fade unless you really know that artist and you know that they've been selecting only a very certain one, certain colors. Um, let's see. I see, do you envision microfade testing being valuable in the future? Uh, I absolutely do. I see microfade testing becoming bigger and bigger, but there's a real question of access to it, that that's something that uh, usually only the biggest museums or places that are attached to a university have that capacity. And I would love to see if someone was offering that in a smaller sense, um, that if someone had a microfeed business and they would come and test your objects for you. Uh, but I do not know anyone that does that yet. Let's see. Okay. A small historic house museum uh, with looking for recommendations for new fixtures and light bulbs. Um, there will be a reference in our technical bulletin for uh, exhibit lighting standards, and I would recommend looking at that. Uh, I think it would be very useful for you. Let's see. For traditional printmaking processes, are there some prints that are more vulnerable than others? Um, it's colored prints that are more vulnerable. Black ink is almost always made out of carbon, which is completely stable. But as soon as you start to introduce color, that's what is going to start to fade. And I think I've moved through all the questions that I've seen. So if I have skipped you, I would ask you to type it again because I've missed you. And I'll wait a minute or two. My email address is up here if you want to follow up on anything more specific. And I would be delighted to hear from any of you. <laughs>
And for anyone who registered but came in a little light, late, uh, we will be posting this presentation on our YouTube channel and you should get the link to that emailed out within a few days. Um, to Aaron's question for the book list, um, I think we will also, when we send out the link to the, oh, Stephanie found it. So this is a link to a technical bulletin about light exposure that uh, Stephanie just put up that's on our website. And there should be a list of references at the end, which I hope will be useful to you. And we could probably find you even more if you've looked through there and you still want more information about light. Well, it's a trick if people are not seeing Stephanie's message, it's because she is logged in as Leah, who is, um, who is our preservation services assistant and usually manages webinars. So we run all the webinars through her account. So if you see a post from Leah Desher, this is a link to our technical bulletin. Okay, I just popped up the link again in the chat coming from me this time. And I'm delighted that you're so interested. You want to read more about it. Okay, I think we could probably shut this down now. It looks like everyone's asked all their questions and thank you so much for attending. I know I ran over a little bit because I just couldn't stop talking. So if there's anything else you want to know, please do email me and I would love to go talk about more light things again.